¿Cuál es el protocolo? Okay, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, people who are behind the screens. It's really a pleasure for the Real Instituto Cano to be here today trying to moderate uh, what I, I guess is going to be a fascinating conversation about Europe and the future of Europe uh, between uh, our uh, vice presidents, uh, Nadia Calviño, and the chairman of the Eurogroup, uh, Pascal Donghi. Uh, I think it's, uh, we have a lot of uh, topics to, to drill in, uh, in the coming minutes, therefore I am going to be very brief. My function to, to here today is just to moderate the conversation and to give the floor to our distinguished panelists. Uh, as you all, all of you know, uh, in the past years, uh, Europe uh, has taken an extraordinary step forward. Uh, the exceptional measures that has been adopted in the, in the European Union to face uh, the COVID epidemic has been quite successful. I can now remember Pascal addressing uh, the Greek economies last year saying we are, we are winning, <laughs> we are winning and I, I wonder if uh, you remain with the same opinion, I guess you have a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, data to support your optimist view. Uh, what we are going to, 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 to do today is I, uh, I will give the floor to Nadia Calviño to, to talk, to, to introduce the topic. Uh, about the opportunities for the euro area in the context of the recovery. We are going to talk, I am sure, about next generation funds, uh, banking, European Banking Union, my capital market, fiscal rules. Therefore, we have a very, very uh, interesting agenda, and I am not going to, to take more minutes. And afterwards, uh, after the, the, the address of uh, Nadia Calviño, I will give the floor to Pascal to, to make some comments, and afterwards we will take questions uh, either from the from the from the floor or from the the, the people who are uh, on the, on the, the screens behind the screens. Uh, and uh, I hope this is going to be a very fruitful morning. Nadia, the floor is yours. Ay, perdóneme. No, perdóneme. Muchas gracias, muchas gracias, José Juan. And a very warm welcome to Spain to dear Pascal, president of the uh, chair, chairman of the of the Eurogroup, and and all the colleagues that have come with him today. It's a it's a great pleasure to have you here, and it's a great pleasure to uh, organize and to participate in this very interesting and timely debate. It is a pity that we cannot have a, a full uh, house. But it is also excellent that we can have so many persons connected and, and therefore that we can conduct the debate, which I'm sure is going to be extremely uh, lively. As, as Jose Juan, uh, the, the uh, president of the Real Instituto Elcano, one of the most important, if not the most important think tank in our country, as he was saying, we're living behind two extremely intense years. Uh, and I think it's great that as a think tank, uh, El Real Instituto Elcano has continued to be extremely engaged, active, and kept uh, the uh, role of thinking and discussing and providing for good ideas and, and different points of view on the issues at stake. And I think this is going to uh, certainly accelerate as we leave these uh, difficult two years behind and go back to having this kind of, of uh, life uh, event. I was just saying that your visit, uh, Pascal, comes at a very timely moment. Uh, it's, a, it's really the right moment to take stock and also to reflect together uh, on the different discussions and debates which are ongoing because this is going to shape the future of the EU. It's going to shape the future of, of the Eurozone. 
And your visit comes at the time where we're marking some very important anniversaries. The first one, of course, is the 20th anniversary of the birth of the euro, which we celebrated in January. And the second is the second year after the start of the pandemic, which has changed our lives in so many ways, including from the economic and social point of view. It is also the 100th anniversary of the publication of Ulysses in, in France. We were just talking about it, but it's probably uh, not the most relevant reference when talking about economic matters. Or maybe I, we will find a, also an angle to this in, in our debate. It is, uh, we, we have a number of important debates uh, on our table and we will be having quite intense discussions, I think, in the coming months in some of the of the main elements to shape the future of the Eurozone. And my uh, aim uh, with these brief remarks is just to focus on three points that I'd like to leave with you uh, for this uh, discussion. The first one is the key lesson learned from these long two years, and that's that we are all on the same boat, that common challenges require common responses, global responses. Uh, that there is a strong interest uh, in responding with one voice to common challenges. And I think that this is actually the experience we've had uh, in the response to the crisis, both from the health point of view. If we hadn't acted together, we wouldn't have had the vaccines. We wouldn't have been able, been able to uh, provide a response. And this uh, Omicron wave that we are living today would have been very different. But also, I think we have to pay tribute to the European response on the economic and social front. Thanks to the financing instruments that we deployed together since uh, spring 2020. Uh, thanks to the coordinated responses provided on the monetary and fiscal fronts, we have avoided a global financial crisis. We have uh, um, guaranteed a stable financial framework and thereby allowed national governments to take the right decisions to minimize structural damage and to protect a strong basis for the ongoing recovery. I think that the response to this crisis has been very different to the response to previous crises and we have learned the lesson that common solutions work better. It is much more efficient to protect than to let something be destroyed and have to build back uh, from scratch. And in that sense, Spain is a particularly good example because uh, economic uh, growth accelerated in the course of 2021. The outlook is, is positive for 2022 and 23. Actually, all analysts and, and financial institutions foresee that Spain will be one of the engines of growth in the euro area this year and next. And we see this a strong recovery, unprecedented recovery when we look back, showing in a real hard data, like the dynamism, the outstanding dynamism of our labor market. All employment indicators have recovered their levels, not before the pandemic, but even before the great financial crisis that started in 2008. Uh, when we're talking about 20 million persons, more than 20 million persons employed, uh, unemployment rate of 13.3%. Uh, and also from the qualitative perspective, when we look at female jobs, female crea job creation, full-time and permanent employment, and uh, actually last week, we, uh, the Congress validated the labor market reform, which is one of the most important structural reforms in our recovery plan, which will support this positive trend, uh, addressing some of the short -term shortcomings that have been dragging growth and prosperity in Spain for decades. Another important hard uh, data uh, that, we, that we are uh, looking at is tax revenues. We have closed 2021 above pre-pandemic levels and above our budgetary forecast. We were very prudent with our forecast. And that also shows this strong recovery that has, uh, is, uh, cannot be compared to the exit from the past financial crisis. So to sum up, my first point would be that probably we have gone through a real life stress test that goes way beyond the wildest dream uh, of the meanest uh, macroeconomic forecaster. I look, you know, some of the colleagues are, are nodding. And so uh, this experience has uh, put us to the test, has shown our weaknesses, but I think also our strengths that have been confirmed. Uh, and uh, and this, this should be a strong basis also when we are facing the upcoming debates. This is precisely my second point. We need to shape our tools with a future-proof approach. 
both at the euro area and at the national level. Um, now, the challenge we have is that this is not just a short-lived bouncing back. We need this to be a strong, uh, sustained recovery, a transformative process that puts us on the path of uh, also sustainable and inclusive growth in the mid-run. There was, I think, a, a building consensus on the need to look at um, sustainability from the economic and social point, uh, economic and financial point of view, but also from the environmental and social point of view. And the pandemic has undoubtedly accelerated the awareness that we need to act now and we need to go in this uh, direction. And this will require unprecedented levels of private and public investment at European and at national level. And this is, first and foremost, a matter of intergenerational fairness. All countries have had to issue unprecedented levels of public debt so as to respond to the pandemic. So we need to absorb this additional debt and we need to take now the right decisions so that this process is not hindering the ability of future generations to make their own decisions, to make their own choices. Uh, so we need to leave them a healthier, cleaner, more sustainable and fairer model that provides them with better opportunities from the personal and the pro professional point of view. This is something we discuss very often no, during our meetings. And I think it is also not just a matter of, of looking at our societies and, and our short-term perspective, but also ensuring that Europe has a stronger uh, strategic autonomy in the um, wake of these geopolitical challenges and tensions. I don't need to clarify any more about this, I think, in this forum. So in order to succeed uh, in facing these challenges, we need future-proof tools. Um, we need to move away from debates of the past, uh, have a future uh, looking perspective and a common response. I don't think that the response to these challenges can be that some countries go faster than others. We are also on the same boat when facing these challenges. And my third and final point is about our shared priorities at the euro level, which we should address on the basis of these two principles I mentioned, acting uh, together and with a future forward-looking uh, approach. Because we have a window of opportunity now to tackle the challenges, to implement measures that will definitely shape the euro for the coming uh, 20 years. Um, and the first element, a uh, first focus uh, for our work should be the swift deployment of recovery plans. Uh, during 2021, we have made enormous uh, progress. In the case of Spain, we have uh, devoted uh, all our energy to ensuring that we got our plan presented, uh, approved, the first pre-financing payment and the first payment linked to the fulfillment of uh, targets and, and milestones. And this uh, year we, uh, we will achieve the, uh, we will reach cruise speed in the deployment of the reforms and the investments. And this is obviously priority number one for us, to make the most of this unique opportunity, the European response, this unprecedented European response, and succeed in having a strong recovery, which is also modernizing the country. A second focus, obviously, at the Eurogroup and, and ECOFIN uh, will be to discuss on the reform of fiscal rules. Uh, this is a key issue because we need to ensure that countries can define consolidation paths that are credible and compatible with sustained growth and job creation. And now that the economic situation is normalizing, it is time to resume this important debate. We have no time to lose. We need a, a renewed uh, fiscal framework which is fit for the future. And uh, um, I'm sure Pascal is going to brief us about his plans in this regard. I am, uh, I am very positive about the calendar that you're shaping up so that we can have a constructive discussion in the coming weeks and months. And I think that when we have this discussion, uh, we need to uh, act with pragmatism and without going back to the old trenches, to the debates of the past I was referring to a moment ago. Because, let's be clear, you know, the uh, current ratios of public debt to GDP are much higher than uh, before the pandemic in all countries of the EU. And therefore, the path for the public debt reduction must be adapted to this new reality and take into account the specific circumstances of each country, avoiding the mistakes of the last uh, financial crisis. 
It is also essential to support public investment and be able to mobilize the necessary amounts of private investments if we want to transform, to modernize our European economies in the wake of the green and digital uh, transitions, also in the wake of these geopolitical uh, tensions. Actually, in previous crises, public investment was the main, the first victim of public consolidation strategies. And Spain is probably the country that suffered the most from underinvestment, which was a huge drag for growth, for future growth, and I think a mistake that we cannot make again. The recovery plan and the uh, um, investment effort that we will do all together, I think, is a, is a good sign that we are not making these mistakes again. And I also think that the institutional architecture of the recovery plan is a good model that could inspire us for the future. Member states must play a leading role in setting their own fiscal targets. We need ownership and rules that can be understood and explained to citizens. Besides fiscal rules, we have other important discussions ahead on strengthening the economic and monetary union. Jose Juan mentioned them. Uh, I am quite sure this will not be the last crisis that the euro has to live through. Uh, as I always say in all the meetings, having lived through the, the last financial crisis as you did, uh, we need to fix uh, the roof when the, while the sun is shining. Uh, we shouldn't wait for the next crisis to break to then have to establish the right governance. And that's why uh, completing the banking union together with the capital markets union is, is another top priority in our agenda uh, to ensure that financial markets in Europe are actually contributing to their role in channeling savings towards productive investment. Uh, so all in all, when we look at the uh, existential debates that we have on our table to a certain extent, I'd say 2022 will be a key year for the euro area. We have a unique window of opportunity we cannot miss. We have to get it right with phase two, the recovery, like we did in the phase one, uh, responding to the pandemic. And you can count on Spain, uh, dear Pascal, uh, to play a constructive role and to drive this uh, Eurogroup uh, inspiring agenda forward, because I think we know the way. So it's just a matter of doing it, eh? doing it together. Let me leave you with this positive, uh, encouraging message and looking forward to listening to your remarks. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is both a great privilege and a pleasure to be with you all here today, uh, to have the opportunity to say a few words about where we stand uh, within Europe and within the Eurogroup, and what is, and I agree with Nadia, a very important moment and very important juncture in our economic and political developments for 22 and for many, many years to become. And I was really taken with the introduction uh, that uh, Vice Prime Minister Calvino gave because she made reference to the number of anniversaries that we have. She reminded us of the very somber uh, anniversary that will approach when we reflect on the two years of responding back to this pandemic. Um, in Ireland, it is the 50th uh, anniversary of us uh, joining what is now the European Union. And indeed, as Nadia also reminded us, it is just the 100th anniversary of the publication of Ulysses by James Joyce. And Nadia um, uh, asked, was there any analogy or relevance that I could draw between the publication of Ulysses and the work of the Eurogroup? Well, I think I would struggle with that, to tell the truth. Uh, while it is difficult to know the views of James Joyce in relation to fiscal rules, banking union and capital markets union, as much meaning as there is in Ulysses, I'd be hard pressed to distill his views on those topics. But nonetheless, at the very, very heart of Ulysses is that it is a masterpiece of European literature. 
It tells the story of three characters, Molly Bloom, Leopold Bloom, and Stephen Dedalus. And while it is a novel set in Dublin, these are three characters and three figures that have a distinctly European identity. And at the very heart of Ulysses is joy seen the development of Irish identity and the development of Irish culture in a European framework. And it is uh, no accident at all that Joyce spent all of his greatest and most creative years actually living outside Ireland, where indeed he wrote both Ulysses and many other of his masterpieces. Uh, but if I look at the relevance of the publication of Ulysses, it is really symbolic that back home in Ireland, we are celebrating its 100th anniversary, while we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of key moments in our independence, and as I said, our 50th anniversary of becoming members of now the European Union. There's a deep symmetry in all of those moments. Which leads me back to what we are discussing here today, the future of Europe, the future of the Euro area, the futures of the people of Spain and the people of Ireland. And when I was uh, coming over uh, Madrid very early this morning, getting ready to land, I was looking out the window of the aeroplane and looking down at your landscape and reflecting on how different your landscape would be to the landscape that I would see if I was coming into Dublin Airport, how different your land looks from a great distance. But of course, reflecting on the European Union and that as a project, that is why as a political project, it is so fundamentally important to us all. Because it reminds us that while we may have differences in geography, we may have differences in climate, we may indeed have differences of language. At the heart of the European Union is an affirmation that we have so much more in common than we have in difference. And it reminds us that by making a political commitment to all that we have in common, it creates a foundation for a structure that helps us to achieve more collectively than we ever could individually. That's at the heart of this project. That while we may differ for reasons of geography, for reasons even at times of language and culture, at the heart of it all, we have so much more in common than we ever have in difference. And that is a source of great strength. And indeed, that strength that foundation is something that was tested so much over the last two years. But as your chair said earlier on, and I agree so much with what Nadia has said, we used that foundation of a common outlook on COVID and a common determination to protect each other, to achieve so much at the most difficult of times. If you look at where we stand now versus where we stood a year ago versus where we stood two years ago, we can make the case to our people that our European response achieved more than an Irish response or a Spanish response could have achieved independently of each other. We came together at a moment of a great test of an existential challenge. And by coming together, and of course there were challenges, of course there were moments where our response would not have been what it should have been. But nonetheless, by coming together, we have overcome so much. Look at what we achieved collectively with our vaccination efforts. Look at what we have achieved economically through measures such as the SURE programme such as Next Generation EU, and look critically at the results of our shared commitment and our shared actions. Our policies worked and they are working. 
If you look at where we are within the euro area, we now have output that is already back to where we were before the pandemic. Euro area unemployment has now reached a record low of 7%. And if I look at the performance of your economy, of the Spanish economy, while it's not yet back to pre-pandemic levels, reflecting, of course, the importance of travel and tourism within your economy, also really important to the Irish economy, look at the speed of the recovery. Look at what you have achieved in protecting income, protecting employment, helping businesses and employers here in Spain to recover. If I look in particular at your performance across the final quarter of last year, where you saw a 2% growth in your income relative to 0.3% across the euro area, it shows what your plans have achieved here and the impact they are having, combined with your continued progress in protecting jobs and getting those who have lost a job back to work. And at this point, I want to recognize the contribution that uh, Nadia, that your government has had, not just to the recovery here in Spain, but to our efforts across Europe. I vividly remember the many, many contributions that were made by Nadia at critical meetings in the Eurogroup and ECOFIN, where she made the case for a different response by Europe to a very different challenge of a pandemic. And it was due in no small part to her advocacy and to her uh, efforts to describe the impact this virus could have on Europe and to make the case for a different response. That not only is Spain in a different place in its recovery, so also is Europe. And it was due to those efforts that it began the process that led to the foundation of the Recovery Fund and Nadia's prominence and her input in this debate was, of course, recognised by all finance ministers across Europe when we saw her recent and very speedy election to now chairperson of the International Monetary and Financial Committee within the IMF. But if you look at where we are now, and if you look at what is to come, Despite new challenges that are developing, that I'll say a word about in a moment, we still should use these fora as an opportunity to make the case for what we have achieved, while never being complacent about challenges yet to come, or underestimating the risks or difficulties of today. Because if COVID-19 has taught us anything, and has taught us so much, it is that we need to continue to acknowledge the uncertainty created by this disease. But that is why the Eurogroup, in our discussions on budgetary policy for 2022, agreed on a moderately supportive fiscal stance for the year. And it's also why Nadia and all her colleagues within the Eurogroup agreed on the need for flexibility and agility in how we respond to an economic situation that changes so quickly. And as we see that change, we also see that change now in the prominence of inflation as a risk for our recovery. And this topic, and in particular developments in energy pricing, has featured very heavily on our Eurogroup agenda since the summer. Monetary policy is, of course, the role and the task of the ECB. But the effect of higher prices on growth and on the purchasing power of those that we represent and serve is, of course, something that is concerning. And moreover, the factors that have influenced these prices are clearly taking longer 
to dissipate than expected. So in the meantime, we must remain vigilant and responsive. And Spain, like my own country, Ireland, has taken a series of measures to protect citizens, to protect economies from the negative impact of higher prices, and particularly for energy prices. So as we look then to the future, within Eurogroup, we'll continue to work tirelessly to reach agreement, to look at how we can put in place the policies and the interventions to help our countries to continue to emerge from the dark difficulties and crisis over the last two years. But, as I said a moment ago, our policies are working. Millions of lives, millions of livelihoods have been protected. The Euro area policy response has been swift, it's been coordinated, it has been powerful, and it has been well balanced. So this in turn brings me to Next Generation EU and the Recovery and the Resilience Facility, which again, Nadia has been a key supporter of throughout all stages of the political discussion. An example of that was the discussion at a very early phase in this debate on the concept of Eurobonds, supported by Spain, but also supported by Ireland because of our recognition of the profoundly different nature of this crisis. And those debates all led to the centerpiece of the EU response to the crisis, the Recovery Fund. And indeed, as just acknowledged, Spain was the first country to receive a successful payment, uh, excuse me, the first country to receive a successful payment request assessment under the facility last December with a disbursement of 10 billion euro. This highlights the very effective implementation of reforms here in Spain, and I'm confident that this level of support will in turn allow you to build on the recovery that is clearly underway here. Within Eurogroup, we're conscious of the need to promote investment, as this is indeed a key driver for the success of our two transitions to a more green, to a more digital future. And indeed, investment has been too low for too long in Europe, a legacy from our past crisis. And this fund, a next generation EU, offers an opportunity to coordinate, to prioritize investment. And from this, we should be able to embrace these transitions to a very different and better future. So as part of this discussion on our future, as you will be aware, last October, the European Commission relaunched the Economic Governance Review. And the Eurogroup is discussing key aspects of this process, specifically the Euro area dimensions, so as to contribute actively and positively to the debate. Our first substantive discussion took place in November. When we considered the processes around the draft budgetary plans and the macroeconomic surveillance procedures, including, for example, the two-pack legislation and the different mechanisms embedded in the so-called six-pack. And these discussions continued into our first meeting of the new year. There has been an exceptionally high level of engagement by ministers in this process. And this will feed into the Commission's deliberations. Over the next number of months, we'll continue to debate aspects of the framework. I'm very much aware of the Alcano's Institute's own work in this area and your own paper in December on this topic. There was indeed a lot in the paper, and I'm sure I'll hear more on this during our questions and answers. But this whole process 
and in particular the work that will lead into our March Eurogroup meeting, where we will debate and I believe reach agreement on the right budgetary policy for the Euro area for 2023, all gives us the opportunity to guide this process forward in a sensible and pragmatic way. We're all aware of the lessons from the past crisis, and we are aware of the very different challenge that we face today. But it will be critical to get this balance right, and in particular, the balance between balancing debt sustainability and how we fund growth and how we fund investment. And while it is too early to draw any conclusions from our discussions to date, I am confident that the Eurogroup will be a key and active participant in the economic governance debate as the Commission develops their proposals. Another key issue that we will be discussing at the Eurogroup is the future of our banking union, a critical part of our economic and monetary union. We know that in looking to a greener and more digital future, we need to find new sources of funding. And this is why we need to strengthen our banking union and our capital markets union. I'm well aware of the deep political sensitivity of this project for many. And an enormous amount of work has gone into this project in recent years, but in particular in the last year and a half. We have made good progress. We have achieved much with an agreement on the reform of the European Instability Mechanism in November 2020 to provide for the establishment of a common backstop to the Single Resolution Fund. This will be operational shortly. And then in the Euro Summit at the end of last year, our leaders again mandated the Eurogroup to finalise a work programme for the completion of banking union. I am committed to fulfilling this mandate and I intend to present a balanced proposal to colleagues in the coming weeks, taking into consideration existing issues from member states, as well as asking governments and ministers to approach this work with fresh eyes. We have a window of opportunity, and due to the shared commitment amongst member states to this project, we have to, in this time ahead, take advantage of what we have achieved in order to make more progress on this part of our union. We must also consider the sizable cost of inaction at this point in terms of signalling or even postponing progress to the next crisis. There is a better way and that involves how we engage in this topic in the coming weeks and months, and then reaching agreement on a new agenda, on a new work programme for how we complete banking union. And while I'm well aware of the difficulty of this work, I'm also optimistic that agreement is within reach, and this will be a critical priority of mine in the coming months. So just to conclude on that point of the possibilities of progress and its value, I opened up my contribution here this morning by acknowledging the anniversaries, acknowledging the value of what we have in common and how this is harnessed within the European Union. And as I look at the challenges that lie ahead, but also look at the opportunities that lie ahead, 2022, promises to be a significant year for overcoming those challenges and grasping those opportunities. And at the heart of that will be a Euro area that's determined to look at how we can have a strong and sustained recovery. And the Euro group of finance ministers within the Euro area that come together to share our views to share our experiences, but critically then, to use those sharing of insights to coordinate our efforts 
and to achieve more collectively than we ever can individually. That's at the heart of that project. And in that project, we rely so much on the ongoing positive contribution that Spain has made to this project, that Nadia has made to our recovery. And I look forward to working with her in the year ahead as we aim to complete these challenging but deeply important projects. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you, because uh, for the two presentations has been really great. <clears throat> a lot of uh, content, rich ideas there. Uh, I take my takeaway are mainly two. On the first one, that since maybe 10 years, the European Union has been able to provide solutions and solidarity uh, to solving the, the economic problems of uh, the, the European Union. And this idea, very important idea that you have raised, that all, despite the difference, we have a common ground to work together, and if work, we work together, this is going to, to, to be much better, it has been much, much efficient that we, we try to create, isolate uh, solutions. Let me, let me uh, try to introduce two main questions. The first one, how we can face the uncertainties that we have, and you have, both of you have, have raised the two main uncertainties that I think uh, worries the European society. On the first one, inflation, and the second one, uh, the high levels of debt. Uh, I, I think these, uh, these needs or requires from you, policymakers, uh, two things. On the one hand, as you have, both of you have done, to recognize that the policy miss has to be rebalanced, and this is an important issue, and how we rebalance the policy mix, and the, your, 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 your uh, focus on how to, <coughs> uh, to, to remake the fiscal rules are a key ingredient of that. The second one is how we can protect the more vulnerable people of the consequence of this uh, uh, rising uh, uh, inflation in the, in the European Union. I, I would like to ask you how we can provide the society with uh, some comfort about the idea that the rebalancing of uh, monetary and fiscal policies, the very extraordinary stimulus we have had in the past, are really, uh, are really to work and are not going to, re to, to derelay, derelay the, the, the recovery that we are there. I think that will be, uh, will be a very important issue uh, that the, the society needs to be reassured that we can rebalance the policy mix without putting at risk the recovery that we are going to, 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 to we, are, we are now there. And I think the role there of the next generation is very important and maybe some of you wants to, 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 to try to, to focus on this, this side. Maybe Nadia, uh, you, you, you can try to... I can start oh. and then uh, Pascal, yes. uh, let me take the, the mask off now, I think we can... Um, well, first on, on inflation, uh, on, on uh, price increases, um, I have a, a number of comments to make, which I make several times a day because this is an issue that comes up in every discussion and I hope you agree with me, Pascal. First, is that we need to take a bit of perspective because we started 2021 with zero inflation. It, uh, it is normal that there is a price uh, rebound when we have such a strong and fast recovery. It has always happened when we exit comparable crisis, and therefore it shouldn't come as a surprise. Um, but, of course, this has a, a, an impact on, on expectations, could have an impact on expectations, could have a, a, an impact on the real economy when it comes to um, debates or discussions or even has a, a direct fiscal impact on some parts of our expenditures. But 
The most concerning element, I think, is energy prices, which is what, what uh, we have put on the table since uh, last summer, and which I think is something we should be addressing also together at European level, because the source of this problem comes from geopolitical and other uh, challenges. Uh, and these uh, gas markets and other uh, energy markets are markets with very large global players and it would be good if we could speak with a stronger voice to try to ensure that prices go back to a more, um, you know, the, the path that, would, that we would have anticipated in our, in our plans. So uh, on that, uh, Spain is very vocal on the need to provide a European response to ensure that we... Uh, uh, update, review our regulatory frameworks that we uh, speak with a stronger voice so that we can uh, try to avoid that uh, the price of, uh, of gas continues to, to go up. Let's see you know, what happens in the, in the course of this year. And then a final word on, on monetary and fiscal policies. My take from the ECB is that they are very well aware of the risk of um, acting too fast or too strongly and therefore uh, having a negative impact on growth and, and job creation. This is my reading of their actions until now and also their public statements. And I think that this is indeed the right monetary policy to ensure that the recovery uh, strengthens in view of the fact that the uh, economic fundamentals in Europe are very different to those on the other side of the Atlantic. And right now our top priority should be growth and job uh, creation. This is my reading and I, I, I think they are very well aware of the need to strike the right balance when, when uh, implementing monetary policy. So I, I want to uh, very much agree with what Nadia has said there, her, her uh, analysis of where we stand at the moment. And uh, Nadia began by saying we should put these current issues into a broader perspective. And uh, I uh, think that is essential in looking at the issues of both inflation and where we are with our levels of public debt. But that very broad perspective for me is a protection of employment and protection of income in the face of a deadly threat that our peoples have had to confront over the last two years. And if you look at where we have stood at different points in the last two years, uh, we as uh, policymakers uh, looked at the possibility of the very economic fabric of the European Union um, coming under the most intense pressure with the gravest of consequences for our future. And we responded to that challenge. And while we do have new issues and new uh, challenges that we have to overcome, I think as we debate those, we should do it in the context of also acknowledging what we've achieved over the last two years. Uh, I've been a member of the Eurogroup now with Nadia for many years. Uh, the recovery fund, sure, concepts like that would have nearly been impossible a few years ago. Now they're happening. Uh, so that's the spirit in which I look at the new challenges um, which uh, we are now confronting. And in relation to where we are with inflation, I know for so many across Europe at the moment who have just worked through the trauma uh, of maybe getting a job back, maybe keeping a business open, uh, to now have to confront the change in the price of the standard of living is another challenge on the top of two years of lots of challenges. But again, as policymakers, whether we're finance ministers or those in the central bank community, uh, we really understand the challenge this poses for citizens and for our recovery. And that is why at a budgetary level, we've all taken steps to uh, support citizens with this rising uh, uh, cost of energy in particular. And then at the European Union, we are working together to see what we can do to better deal with these challenges in the future and to reduce some of the effects that we are discussing. So yes, entirely appreciate the importance of where we are at the moment and the challenges that we now confront. Uh, uh, but there's many that thought we couldn't overcome the challenges of the last two years. 
They're not overcome yet, but I think we've done well. And that same spirit will guide us into the issues that you're raising now. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> I'm really very happy to, to hear that uh, we agree, or I, I agree fully with what you are saying. Uh, you have been able to provide uh, very flexible answers, but do you remain in, your, in the back of your mind that all the things that has been done by the community has to provide a much better medium term for our societies. Uh, I think this is the point that I will keep of what uh, both of you are saying. One of the things that uh, uh, I, uh, I think it's that maybe uh, from a strategic point of view to talk about just uh, fiscal rules or what is going to be the stance of monetary policy, it's a very poor approach to, this, to, to, to the reality. I think that we have to keep in mind the real potential of the European Union to provide this much better welfare for, for their citizens. And in this, in this uh, sense, I think that maybe Europe has not been able to fully take advantage of what they can do, we can do. Uh, a very special area is the uh, banking and capital markets uh, uh, union. Uh, we know that we are going to need in the next 10 years investment of 350 million billion dollars, billion euros. To, 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 to be able to, to, to engage in the, in the transition, the climate transition. But we, capital markets are very thin, and our banking, uh, banking uh, system is quite fragmented. How we, can move, how, how we can move forward, how we can make a much complete uh, European uh, banking union and capital markets because I don't I don't I can't see how we are going to 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 integrate reforms in the fiscal from uh, more active monetary policy without being able to call and mobilize the incredible amount of world savings to provide solution for our more more uh, pressing problems maybe so, so I began by saying that I, earlier on uh, in my contribution that I'm not too sure what James Joyce would think of economic governance or the stability and growth pact. <laughs> and likewise, um, I think if I was to uh, leave your building here today and go and meet a, uh, um, uh, a resident here in this wonderful city of Madrid, uh, uh, going to university, going into their workplace, I think if I was to approach that person and say, what do you think of capital markets union or banking union? Um, I'm not sure they'd have too high a level of enthusiasm <laughs> or even interest in my question. But at the heart of why I think this is important is that if you were to walk down a street in Dublin today, and if you were to talk about people in Dublin, to people in Dublin about what they think of climate change, or what do they think of new forms of technology that can change our lives? I believe that the kind of answers you would hear in Dublin would be pretty similar to the kind of answers you would hear here in Madrid. And that is the case I keep on making for our common efforts, that we have so much in common in terms of our outlook on really important issues, Yes, we differ much. Yes, the difficult the negotiations are never easy, but there is that common outlook is so important, which then does lead back to capital markets union and banking union. You know, why do I think it's so important? It's so important that for the sake of the students that are in school today, uh, for those who are just beginning their lives here in Europe, we are so aware of how different their futures are going to be to what we now have today. And we're aware of the threats, the difficulties and challenges they may yet face. And we have to do better. In order to do better, we need more money. In order to find that money, we have to better organize our banking markets and our capital markets here in Europe. So how are we going to do it? 
so uh, I'm here actually to consult um, with Nadia on this topic here today. Um, uh, the key principles of doing that will be to recognise that different countries have both different views on how it could be developed and different concerns. So in order to recognise that, we need to move forward on all the different elements of banking union together. We have to recognise all of the different pillars of the project and give equal importance to all of them. Uh, secondly, I think we need to find ways in which we can build confidence in the project um, and uh, encourage each other that as we move forward uh, on different elements of banking union, we're doing it in an atmosphere of trust, of having developed and delivered different commitments in that project. Uh, and then finally, it's always about relating it back to the bigger picture. That if you look at the, you know, the terminology in it, you know, my God, you know, financial integration, reducing you know, uh, 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 risk, these are not the topics that might excite people uh, who uh, you know, we seek to explain Europe to and make the case to Europe for. But it goes back to jobs, investment, and a safer future. That's what it goes back to. And uh, that's the framework within which uh, I'm going to be approaching my efforts in the next few months. Thank you, Pascal. Nadia? Yes, let me, uh, th three points to complement what Pascal has just said, uh, and I fully 100% agree with, with, what, uh, with your views. The first one is indeed, that there is a danger when we're discussing about these issues that people think this is very technical, and it isn't at all. This is extremely political, and these debates have an impact on the lives of people. And uh, I think in the last two years, we have succeeded, actually, in making our discussions and our statements more approachable, more understandable, more user-friendly, citizen-friendly, and we have to continue on this track. When we are discussing fiscal rules, nobody understands them. Nobody understands the methodology. It's very difficult to communicate them. And that's why in my introductory remarks, I said we need to think about rules and simplify them and, and ensure ownership. And that requires, first and foremost, that we can explain them and, the, and their impact. And that is why when I am approached about the review of fiscal rules and people ask me, so are you for or against 60% debt ratio or 1 20th uh, uh, rhythm for debt consolidation or this or that? And they focus on a very small detail. I always ask people to move back, take a top down, a broader perspective, which is exactly what Pascal was saying, which is, this is a matter of intergenerational fairness. This is a matter of how are we going to ensure that we absorb the extra debt that we should to respond to the pandemic in a manner which is compatible with growth, compatible with job creation, and also with the necessary investments to provide the young generations with a better future. And this is what we're discussing, which is not at all technical. That's my first point. My second point is that this actually puts the debate in a place where we can avoid going back to the debates and the trenches of the past, because we are all on the same boat uh, here. All countries have a different starting point than before the pandemic. All countries in Europe need to undertake this massive, unprecedented investment, and we all want to do it right. Eh? So that, I think, is a good basis, this window of opportunity for us to, to move ahead. And the, my third and, and final point, because Pascal mentioned very much uh, or often the word confidence and trust, which is indispensable when we are engaging in any negotiation, uh, even more when we are engaging in negotiations uh, where the starting points, the concerns and the views are so different. You were talking about the landscape when you were landing. Uh, of course, the, the perspective of a Spanish citizen or an Irish citizen or a Hungarian citizen is very different mm -hmm. to these debates. And it's very important to listen to each other, to try to understand the concerns of the other, to try to find this common ground. Uh, but I am very confident, uh, and to go back to, to your, your remarks, uh, Pascal, because we have already done it, which was my closing statement, my closing remark, which is we have done it right with phase one, so we should be confident we will also get it right in phase two and phase three, you know, in shaping the future of the Eurozone. 
uh, we have built, I think, good uh, working relations, trust and confidence uh, amongst us. And when we see that we have succeeded in protecting our citizens and ensuring a good response to the crisis by acting together, well, you know, it, it only takes uh, to act in the same manner. Uh, but, uh, of course, it's not easy. Eh? We're talking about very complicated matters. Uh, the options are, all, all the different options have pros and cons, and so we have to weigh very well the different options to reach a, a balanced outcome. But the starting point, I think, is quite encouraging uh, in, in the sense of providing the right responses with a future-proof and future-looking, forward-looking approach. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I think time is running out, but just a final comment. <laughs> uh, I was in your shoes uh, some time ago, in fact, last century, <laughs> in the 90s. And I, I remember, remember that Hans Dittmeyer used to say something that uh, caught my, my mind. He said, money belongs to the community, not to the prince. And when we think about the euro, uh, I, I have uh, go back from time to time to this observation of Tiet Meyer. What do you think has been the uh, evolution of euro, not just as an international currency that I see is in your, your program, but in the society? Has uh, this bet for the euro been a big success? How, how we have moved forward and how we can secure that uh, this international role for the euro, it's also complemented by a role, a, 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 a currency that is felt as their own currency and creates community. Mm. Maybe I'll go first so that you mm. close. Uh, uh, so, uh, yes, when I look back, and, uh, and when we look back 20 years ago, yeah. getting the euro uh, on the ground uh, and uh, making it real, was not an easy challenge. Actually, it required a lot of, it was a massive logistics uh, exercise. It was also an exercise that required trust. I think we wouldn't have succeeded if people wouldn't have trusted their merchant, their supplier, you know, citizens trusting each other, countries trusting each other. It was, and, and I think the euro is undoubtedly one of the biggest uh, success stories of the uh, building of Europe and also one of the biggest uh, and the most important symbols of our unity and our strength when we act together. And citizens in Europe, the, the support for the euro and ownership of, um, and feeling of, of um, belonging, you know, uh, is increasing every year. So it, I think, proves that this is a, a success uh, story, undoubtedly. And we have to take it from here and continue building on the international role of the euro. I'll let Pascal uh, share uh, his views on this, but I very strongly support the need to modernize the euro, to think about this digital euro, and to uh, continue to, to increase our role from an international perspective, because this has been one of the uh, elements of stability, prosperity and, um, and welfare for European citizens, no doubt about it, in the last uh, 20 years. So I, I go back to the case I make for Europe, which is how we harness what we have in common to achieve more collectively. And I think the euro is the strongest example of uh, that uh, foundation of the European Union. Uh, the euro, for me, is more than a currency. It is a political articulation of shared values and a commitment to each other. And if I look at what it has achieved, uh, for me, the most important thing that it has achieved is the ease with which we can now travel to each other, study with each other, work with each other, experience each other's cultures and holiday with each other. That is uh, such an essential element of our common journey of the last two decades. And when I look to the future, uh, I think there are three pillars to the future that we will build. The first one is responding back to the challenges and opportunities that Nadia and I 
have both acknowledged here today, whether it be how we support Europe in growing, to look after our citizens, whether it's how we respond back collectively to the climate crisis, responding back to those challenges uh, is essential to the international future of the euro. euro. Secondly, will be the digital future of the euro. Uh, as we see so many changes taking place in means of payment in stores of value from the private sector, um, I believe uh, how we secure our monetary sovereignty uh, is a very important element of our future in Europe and see the euro again being essential to that. And then finally, it is our efforts in a, a transition to a lower carbon future. Uh, I believe Europe can be a world leader in the technologies needed to do that. And if we can be a world leader in developing the technologies to do that, that should be a, another way in which we develop the euro. And for me, I want to see the euro become the currency across the world to move into a lower carbon future, which we should be able to do, given the role we are playing in developing the technologies to get to that point. So um, in 20 years' time, if the three of us are here again today, here, here together, discussing what we have achieved during that period, there are the three things that I think if we can achieve them, and I believe we can, will represent a further strengthening of the European project which at the end of the day is for the benefit of the people of Ireland and the benefit, of course, for the people of Spain. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, all of you, all of, all of us, thanks both of you for your presentation. It has been really a pleasure. Uh, very, it's uh, very optimistic. I, 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 I trust on you. <laughs> I think you are going to work harder on this very important challenge. And on behalf of the Real Instituto and all the people who has been to thank all of you, I, I, can, I can prevent myself from saying something about Ulysses has been coming in and coming out of this presentation. <laughs> and if you want to have one of the most blowing mind photo that you can find about Ulysses, just go to Pascal's Twitter account. <laughs> and you will see there Marilyn Monroe reading the last pages, not the first, the last pages of Ulysses. I think this is something to, 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 to think about it, how, how the world has changed, and something is a hope that maybe we can, we can, we can have these very big names of the uh, European Ireland's, but European literature uh, among us and leading us. I hope to be on Dublin 16 June next year <laughs> and to, 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 to be able to, to take advantage of that. You thank you. You're thank you. welcome. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, everybody, and thank you for your question and your interest. Thank you.